The radio pharmaceutical market's very hot right now. We've seen three major transactions in the last six months. You know, what are your thoughts on those market dynamics and and why Big Pharma's so excited to enter the space? Yeah, it's fascinating, isn't it, Mel? It's like, I don't think I've seen a market like this in, you know, the quarter of a century I've been in biotech, Yeah. right? Uh, to have companies jump in, the recent one, AstraZeneca, coming in and buying Fusion for basically a generic product that wasn't even really through a phase one yet. Um, IIT, investigator initiated trial, it wasn't even part of the phase two or three and being acquired for 2.4 billion US is a big number. Um, and it's an actinium based asset. Actinium still has a long way to go to prove itself out, uh, as a, as a viable isotope, whether it's on the manufacturing side and then also the safety profile, given it's very different to the beaters that we're in. Uh, last year, Lilly jumping in, like Lilly is the biggest pharmaceutical company on earth right? To come in and buy Point, which once again was generic, the same asset actually, INT, um, but this time with Letitium. Um, and we really sold a little bit of a story. At, you know, if you dose less with a with a product like that, you're going to get better results than the, the incumbent, Plavicto. We think that was a flawed you know, you know, way of thinking about it. It came out about that the, the, obviously the trial was was less optimal than the Plavicto asset, right? So, uh, but Lily, uh, now I've got a toe in the water, but it'll be interesting to see how they evolve. You know, at the moment, they've uh, their main products are, you know, making thin people thinner. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, so Radio Farm is a very different space, and I think they have to work themselves up a learning curve, particularly in acquiring a company like Point that really had licensed out the assets as well. So they don't really have a lot in that portfolio. Um, but BMS was an incredible acquisition. It um, was, yeah. You know, for Dota Tate again to be acquired, and this time with Actinium and Nets, a very small group. But BMS BMS has stated they want to be a major player in the space. Um, where we find ourselves in that mix now is um, – there's quite a few uh, other pharma companies. As far as we're concerned, if pharma now are looking at radio pharma as a strategy, they're not serious players, particularly in oncology, right? We've seen the ADCs take off, the antibody drug conjugates take off for a period of time, despite you know some of the safety issues that are, uh, revolve around the use of antibodies, right? Radio pharma is this new space in the next 10 years are going to be incredibly exciting, right? So pharma need, if they're not in it, they need to get in it. Uh, if they are in it with a toe in the water, they need to build out a portfolio. Pipeline. Exactly. They don't. They, none of these companies necessarily have pipelines. Where we've always positioned ourselves is from the bottom up: create really good products, build intellectual property around that. So we don't we don't develop uh, generics like some of the other groups have, have, have developed. But then that supply chain and manufacturing needs to be locked in as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we've got both. As opposed to other companies, we've got this strategy of diagnostic and therapy. Now, yes, diagnostic is probably less interesting for big pharma, unless you could add some value to maybe their incumbent assets, uh, drive out better uh, diagnosis of patients, and then grow that with the expectation of having a fantastic therapy that could make make its way up potentially uh, into those first-line therapies. That's exactly where we've positioned the company. You know, we're focused at the moment on copper 64 and 67 because of the dynamics in that. And we have one product um, and it can be both diagnosis and therapy. It's just altering the isotope. Yep. So this is an incredible time. Uh, You know, when we look at those dynamics going on, the major prostate players are still not in it. AstraZeneca now have moved um, with with INT uh, actinium at a very early stage in its development. We think there's great opportunity now. And the prostate players have to play, will have to play at some point in time, given the benefits in prostate. And we have two assets, obviously, in, in prostate itself. Uh, and then, but the rolling out of this opportunity, we have a parado- paradigm opportunity where we constantly thinking about what's the next asset, what's the next asset. So, because in, in the reality is we could have 10, 20, 30, 40 assets utilizing the copper 64, 67 paradigm, let alone utilizing maybe some other isotopes that we're looking at when we've built new intellectual property uh, around, for instance, our best PSMA products. Um, so we're excited about that. We're excited that big farmers suddenly woken up to the opportunity based purely around the safety and efficacy of Radio Farm. Uh, but now, you know, and you see a lot of companies with some good ideas 
but don't necessarily have the manufacturing, don't have that capability, don't have that expertise, um, but they might have a, a product and an isotope that they're trying to put together. We think the next few years that'll start to flush out. Um, we think there's a lot of isotopes that won't make it to market, even though they've got a little bit of excitement about them now. And we think uh, copper 67 as a therapeutic isotope is fantastic. At the moment, uh, and we've just recently announced it's all manufactured under one roof, isotopes through to finished product, um, and uh, which no one else is doing that because Correct, you can't yeah. do that with lutetium or actinium or those sorts of things at this point in time. And uh, and we think it's an exciting time ahead. So do you think it is the, the therapeutic assets that are really driving that interest from Big Pharma as opposed to the diagnostics? Yeah, that's a good question, Mel. So um, definitely from a Big Pharma perspective, Big Pharma is interested in therapies, right? So we've spent a lot of time in developing our therapy, uh, copper 67 best PSMA. As I mentioned before, we think it's a best-in-class asset. The best PSMA agent ever invented is our, is our view, right? So, um, so on a therapy basis, we spend a lot of time in this dose optimization and now the dose expansion, trying to get to a dose which is relevant because no other products have done that. Plavicto never did that, right? No, correct. So, um, so we spent a lot of time optimizing that because we think uh, there's a great opportunity, for, certainly to get to f even first-line therapies and combination therapies and those sorts of things. And copper 67 is perfectly suited for that as a beta, mm -hmm. as opposed to the alphas, uh, which are a little bit more stronger in energy and and the like. And, the, and then obviously the side effects are an issue. So this is a fantastic opportunity for us to do that. But that doesn't mean the diagnostics are not interesting, right? So we've got a, a, a you know a couple of companies now, which are three companies actually, that have developed these uh, PSMA diagnostic agents and are driving that market out. Um, but this concept of pass-through reimbursement that goes away in three years um, from the day that you launch uh, uh, is a massive issue. And uh, and there's even though those companies were very public in saying that we're you know, that's going to go away. Uh, we're going to keep reimbursement forever. You know, the US government isn't passing a lot of bills at this point in time. So uh, so we've said from the beginning, that's very, very unlikely. And it looks like that's the play, right? So we'll be coming to market just when that's all occurring. Really good timing for yeah, you guys. Yeah. With, with, a, with, a, with a great agent, um, diagnostically, uh, and, and and obviously to have that next day imaging as well to pick up really to overcome the issues of the current PSMA agents. Mm -hmm. So that's a great opportunity for us. It's a great value driver. Um, but really, when we look at us as a company, therapy is key, right? But to have the same product that is able to do the things we can do diagnostically and compete in that market very, very well, and then have the therapy as the same product, but just altering the isotope that's is an incredible unique, position. Right? It's very nice. unique, right? Compared to the other products that are there, very unique. Um, and when we're looking at the supply chains, we just don't have the issues around supply chains that others would have. The short half-lives of fluorine and gallium, um, really it's probably going to be a time where we need to flush that right out. Let's go back to a model which is sustainable, high, man high uh, volume manufacturer, centralized manufacturer, broad distribution, all under GMP, not a lot of the mixing near hospitals and those sorts of things. Let's lift the standard and, uh, and get great products to patients. Better diagnosis always leads to better therapy. Um, so let's get, uh, really the goal for us is to image earlier and, and have that ability to detect lesions much earlier, particularly in that BCR space when we're looking at, looking at therapies, and then to treat and treat these patients so we can get some better outcomes. That's really the goal of us, and we can do that under one roof. 